I'm Marianne McPherson from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Welcome to our virtual conversation series, Leadership Insights, where we talk with IHI's experts and partners. Today, I'm speaking with Drs. Carly Riley and Frida Roy in a conversation focusing especially on health, well being, and equity measurement. Welcome, Brita and Carly, and thank you both for talking with me today. I'll open with a question for both of you. Um, our journey together began through the 100 Million Healthier Lives Initiative that IHI convened and both of you helped to lead the metrics and measurement team for, which aimed to transform how the world thinks and acts about health, well being, and equity. We've had the privilege of leading together as part of the 100 Million Healthier Lives movement that has now come to an end, but lives on through your work, the work of IHI, and so many other partners and communities globally. As leaders in your respective communities and fields, could you each share a little bit about why being part of this initiative was meaningful? And if it's okay, I'd love to start with Rita and then move to Carly. Sure, um, so I think it was really meaningful for, for many, many reasons, but one of the major reasons we really enjoyed participating in the initiative was um, the, the number of partnerships we were able to create um, outside of our institutions and connecting with so many different types of people and organizations around the country and also around the world um, that were all really focused on, on trying to improve health and well-being. And these included um, partnerships with public entities, um, local and national you know, governments, but then also um, private organizations or, or not-for-profits. Um, so I think those relationships and partnerships uh, really were, were very impactful. In addition, um, just the opportunity uh, to to create kind of some national traction around the concept of well being um, uh, was really important to us. Um, you know, we, we felt this paradigm of, of well being was, was really important and, and really takes a step forward in, in thinking about how we frame and define health. Um, and to actually see that getting picked up more widely, broadly, and at the national level um, was, was truly phenomenal. Yes, and I will build on that in that um, two things that were particularly meaningful about the initiative were its mission and its method. Um, the, the mission, as Brita has already um, spoken to, really of shifting context um, in deep partnership with communities and other stakeholders to create and foster um, greater well being um, and doing so um, with equity at the center. Um, that is such an extraordinarily meaningful, necessary, vital mission and one that really matters to people um, and speaks across sectors. Um, so that was um, absolutely something uh, essentially meaningful about the entire initiative. But um, this is embodied also in its method. Um, and so the, the deep engagement, uh, the, the, the real eye to uh, authentic co-production, the creating distributive leadership, so redistributing power and, and intentionally seeking ways to do so and continually interrogating ourselves into you know, how are we contributing to either sustaining or disrupting the, the status quo. Um, and, and doing so um, in the ways that really honor um, people in place um, has been very meaningful. Thank you both very much. I'd like to continue with a few questions for you, Carly. You noted uh, the need to focus on people and place, and that's where I'd love to continue next. Crisis events like the pandemic can call for a somewhat different leadership skill set. Um, or at least for emphasizing different areas of leadership. In March of 2020, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, where you're based, was busy planning the next 10 to 15 years as a partner in the city's All Children Thrive Learning Network. And this was happening when the pandemic hit. So in a very short period of time, you and your network partners 
or having to rapidly reorient your network's focus to deal with the immediate crisis. As we think about the work that 100 Million Healthier Lives has helped to accomplish through partnerships and through putting equity at the center, could you share a little bit about the leadership skills and or some of the strategies that you and your co-leaders tapped into to adapt to that immediate crisis? I will speak to a number of different ways in which we did so. Um, first, we leveraged the built capacity that we had already created over the last multiple years. Um, we had already developed um, deep working relationships, built partnerships, um, created a lot of know-how and had built a number of muscles already in the use of quality improvement uh, as well as co-production, not only um, within um, our own um, healthcare setting, but also um, in community with our partners and with um, families. And so we leveraged that already built capacity that we'd been investing in. But we also had to lean into new partnerships. And so there was a need, a demand for new um, cooperation, new collaboration. The barriers to innovation and cooperation um, were now dropped in the setting of a crisis. And so we needed to lean into spaces that we had not previously um, really developed capacity within. And we did that led entirely by family and community voice. So the first thing that we did was we turned to the families that we were engaged with and we wanted to know what were their current and immediate future needs and hopes. And then we pivoted our um, action and our team structure uh, to align uh, solely with that. We then had to look to data to determine our focus and where we're gonna be our first and second areas of action. And then we utilize that built muscle of rapid cycle learning for urgent progress. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Rita, I'd love to, to turn back to you now. As you well know, there are many tools and resources for improving the health of populations and closing equity gaps. And some of those tools include how health systems have used the Pathways to Population Health Framework and associated tools to support their work with patients, families, and communities. I'm curious about what lessons and strategies from organizations, whether yours or others, that are on this population health and equity journey might be applied to your organization or community. Sure, thanks for that question because um, it actually has been a, an added bonus <laughs> working on, on all of this with the Pathways to Population Health team. Um, uh, really, there are a number of things that have been useful to apply directly to my own organization. I think first and foremost was the compass developed by the Pathways to Population Health team. Um, so the, the compass is essentially a survey um, that you can give to you know, multiple people in your organization. Um, that assesses your organization in a number of areas uh, related to both the health system, but also relationships with community to improve health and well-being. And it organizes those things into four, por four portfolios. Um, and I found it really helpful to give the compass to a number of colleagues that I work with, both in my practice, but also um, our partner organization and the health system and my colleagues in population health and, and quality. Um, so they also could be on the same page um, as to, you know, how we might be able to align efforts. And we could all look at our kind of individual assessments of how we think our organization is doing in those various areas and reflect on those. Sometimes there are differences um, uh, in, in how we may perceive uh, some of these programs and efforts. And it helps us to figure out, um, you know, together where we think we are and give us ideas as to where we can go next. Um, so I, I really did think that was helpful in aligning um, partners across the system. In addition, um, I thought there was a lot of great tools to how I could um, further implement how we um, share 
data transparently in our organization and also just structure our work around program development and assess our progress over time. So for example, using driver diagrams is not something that we did um, at this organization previously, but it's something I you know, got much more familiar with, was able to introduce, um, and it's something you know, that, that people here picked up and we found really valuable. In addition, holding quarterly milestone meetings where we can, again, evaluate our, our progress and metrics for each of those initiatives in our di driver diagram and decide collectively um, how we want to um, take next steps. Finally, it, it provided the opportunity to uh, network and learn more about how other institutions are truly transforming in population health and well-being. Um, and so to be able to share examples of how other institutions um, have developed a shared governance model uh, with community in order to um, improve health and well-being through health system and community efforts collaboratively um, has, has truly been transformative here as well. So I think a, a number of tools, uh, but also a number of ways um, to, to take really leaps and bounds um, here how, in, in transforming population health. Thank you, Brita, for all of that. That's, that's tremendously helpful to hear. I'm wondering if you might now um, discuss some of the population health and equity driven responses to this moment, <laughs> to COVID-19 and its impacts, including ways of mitigating impact on the health of individuals and communities. I know that you have been on the front lines of this for the last year plus. So with, with the, first wave of the pandemic, which, um, you know, we're here on the East Coast in New Haven, Connecticut, our first wave actually started almost exactly a year ago. And um, at that time, we were able to work with our colleagues in infectious disease and infection prevention, um, in virology, uh, um, you know, a number of um, experts really across our health system and our university to develop uh, treatment algorithms for the inpatient setting um, and actually administer those across our various hospitals, across our delivery network, um, such that everyone truly was treating every patient the same way. And uh, we actually looked at the data after each of our waves of, of COVID and found that there were no differences in our outcomes uh, in, in mortality or morbidity by race or sex um, in either of those ways. We're about to look um, at the data at our, at our third wave. Um, so I think that that systematic approach to treatment um, you know, really provided uh, equitable outcomes. So while we certainly sit, did see differences in who was admitted, um, at least once they got to care in our system, we can say that was equitable. In addition, uh, we've had a very um, uh, strong focus on equity in vaccine access and uptake, both internally among our healthcare workers and externally um, among vulnerable populations in the community and, and our, um, our neighborhoods. And, We've had a number of strategies to try to increase access and improve uptake uh, in, in both of those groups. So one, everything has been you know, data-driven. So among our healthcare workers, we're able, we don't have race and ethnicity data, but we do have data on job role. And we are able to see that while across our system at large, we have a 75% vaccine uptake, which is pretty good. We have only, now, roughly 50% uptake among those job roles that are lower wage and hourly. And um, that is an in that 50% is an increase from initially around 25% a couple of months ago. Um, and in, or in order to get there, you know, it's it has been talking with those groups directly, understanding um, challenges to accessing the vaccine, addressing concerns they may have about the vaccine. Um, and really just trying to confront those you know, head on with, 
with accurate information, but also making it really easy um, to get the vaccine for them. With our community, uh, we have developed collaborations with a number of community partners, um, but also created a coalition of healthcare workers, not just from our health system, but also other entities in our areas uh, to be able to meet people where they are, um, whether it is at food pantries or soup kitchens or homeless shelters or community-based organizations or literally going door to door. Um, these outreach workers can provide information about the vaccines and help people schedule. And we have actually um, set aside a specific allotment of our vaccines for people that live in socially vulnerable zip codes. Uh, we have algorithms um, that can tell where someone's calling from. So if someone's phone number, um, not, uh, um, based on our records, if they're calling from a place that's in one of these socially vulnerable zip codes, they will be eligible for one of those vaccines that we are holding for those groups. In addition, um, healthcare workers, uh, sorry, uh, community health workers uh, are able to schedule into those slots as well. And, you know, the, the general public cannot see them. So that creates a, a way that we can make sure that you know, it's not just the people with the means and, you know, with great, you know, Wi-Fi and computer access can jump ahead of everyone else and take up all the vaccine slots. Um, we do try to reserve uh, some for people in these more vulnerable groups. We've also been holding um, uh, community mobile uh, vaccine clinics uh, where we go out to the community and actually um, administer vaccines on site at local churches or other community-based organizations in these neighborhoods as well. Can you say a little bit about, a little bit more about what, what measuring well-being is and why it's important? Sure. So well-being is, you know, a truly holistic and, and per person-centered strength-based measure that includes the positive end of the spectrum. So traditionally in, in medicine, you know, we considered health as, as just the absence of disease, but well-being uh, is more than just the absence of disease. And so having that positive end of the spectrum of thriving um, is the extra critical component uh, around well-being. Um, it is also really what matters to people. Um, so in providing individual responses, each individual person is really reflecting on what matters to them. And it therefore encompasses multiple dimensions of life um, rather than narrowed or, or siloed areas of focus. Um, so they may or may not be thinking about health when they answer questions about well-being. They might be thinking about other aspects of their life, um, like their social relationships or the quality of activities that they can engage in or um, having a sense of purpose and direction uh, in what they're doing every day. So those are some of the things that are incorporated in well-being. And again, it can be very unique and tailored to, to each individual person based on what matters to them most. Thank you, Brita. Carly, I'd love to, to turn to you for, a, for the next few questions. Um, different measures can be used to understand well-being of people and of communities. They can also be used to advance equity and promote collaboration and shared leadership and shared power. A, a bit of a two-part question. Uh, first part of it is, what are some of the tools and approaches that you have used as a leader in your organization and community that you've recommended um, to others who are aiming to measure well being and or use well being to guide improvement effort, efforts. And part two is when you've seen uh, organizations or communities adopt a well being focus and, and measurement as part of that focus, what has been some of the value and or impact that you've seen emerge? Similar to what we've done through 100 Million Healthier Lives in many different communities, not only across the US, but also the world, we have been utilizing multiple different person-centered self-report measures of well-being, including the Cantrell's self-anchoring scale or Cantrell's ladder measure. And we've been innovating in how to utilize that across the life course. And so not only asking adults in our community about their own well-being, but also asking youth 
and then finding our ways to measure those same constructs for children as well. And we've been doing this not only in clinical, but also community settings. And we've used um, this at individual as well as population levels, um, looking at the percentage of the different populations that are thriving, struggling, and suffering, but then also looking at who is thriving and who is not thriving. And we have found that there are multiple ways to utilize the Cantrell's ladder items. The first ladder item of current life satisfaction um, provides us a way into to thinking about certain aspects of community and individual life. The future life optimism or anticipated life satisfaction, which is that future looking question, um, provided us a way into other conversations that have been incredibly um, informative and necessary, particularly in neighborhoods in which answering a question on a five-year timeline was incredibly challenging and prompted conversations around um, what would be needed in these communities, with these communities, for these communities to be able to think about five years from now, rather than solely tomorrow or next week. We also have been able to look at the gap between those two measures as a way into talking about hope and where and who has hope within our community and where does it not exist and who does not have it and what does that tell us. The most powerful thing though that I have experienced in all of this has been when we give those data to the community and interpret them with the community themselves. And so I'll give one example within one of our um, with one of our community groups uh, in a local neighborhood here, um, we had the entire group complete those questions for themselves and for their children oh, every quarter for an entire year. And then we mapped these data and gave them back and had community conversations about what they were seeing. The idea that there was a child in their community who was suffering that there were multiple children that were struggling, that many of them that they would look left and right to were not thriving was an extraordinarily powerful call to action. And that led to a whole lot of other conversations about why is that and what do we need to do about it together collectively. That's so powerful. As you were talking about measuring hope and then that experience of kind of looking to your left and right about children in your community who are suffering and or struggling, like the hairs on my, on my arms are standing up. That was really powerful. Thank you for sharing it. Um, thinking about going from the, the super local to, to, the, to the national, you've both been involved in the development of the well-being in the nation or WIN measures. You with others in more than 100 organizations and communities who worked across sectors to identify and try out measures that mattered to them related to the well-being of people, the well-being of places, and equity. This was a collaborative process that 100 Million Healthier Lives and IHI facilitated and was supported by the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics, who created the national, the, excuse me, the foundational framework for WIN. As you know, uh, WIN offers a set of common measures to assess and improve population and community health and well-being across sectors and in some core areas for well-being of people, place, and equity. And as you also, I'm sure, know, most communities across the nation, or at least many, don't have the resources to identify and test relevant measures or to collect enough broad-based data to really support decision-making. So the, the WIN measurement effort represents a huge step forward. And part of its intent is to be able to balance both common things nationally and to allow for what matters locally. So we know that health and community systems are applying the framework in different ways. Carly, I'm wondering if you could share how the wind measures are being applied in the field, whether that's in your community or elsewhere. First, I'll speak to the power of the framework itself and the unique opportunity that it provides in that it allows a different kind of conversation to happen in that individuals and organizations and institutions across systems and sectors can all see themselves together contributing to health, well-being, and equity. 
the way that the framework is designed is that there are measures across each of these different dimensions of um, individual family community life. And, and it allows folks to say, this is the piece of the puzzle that I am either holding or I'm influencing. And so it creates that kind of ecosystem um, within which people can start to locate themselves all as being centered around the same problem and the same ambition. And that's one way that we have utilized it here locally in Cincinnati, but that's also how we have seen different communities and also different systems across the United States utilize this framework. It brings people across sectors together, all with a shared aim and understanding. It also provides measurement um, ideas and um, amplifies a conversation around measurement that isn't typically utilized. Um, and so there are key parts of the framework um, that are really pushing on areas of measurement that should become much more commonplace. Um, things around the social environment, social connectedness, but also around people's experience of others. And so um, discrimination uh, and the experience of discrimination and the experience of, of safety across multiple different dimensions. Those are all infused into this framework as well. Um, and we have found that to be incredibly um, useful in that there are many communities who've said, this really matters to us here. We think this is a key part of our theory of change, but we don't know how to measure it. And then we're able to say, we agree. We think that's a key part of this framework. And in fact, there are ways to measure this. Here in Cincinnati, we've then been able to start to think about, well, if this really matters and is a key part of our theory of change, how then are we gonna build the muscle and the infrastructure to measure this on an ongoing way? And we've been able to start to test our way into it, just like we've seen in many other communities across the United States. Thank you so much. I really, again, appreciate that connection between the local work and this guiding national framework. Um, and I know that the importance of well-being measurement is getting threaded through a lot of places. Um, one of Healthy People 2030's many foundational principles is the health and well-being of all people and communities as essential to a thriving, equitable society. As you reflect on where we've come, where the field is now, um, Carly, I'm curious about what, what you think might be some of the, the big directions to pursue or some of the big questions that still need answers related to this work. The focus on well being and the centering on equity are fundamentally essential to transforming or recreating systems and communities such that every person in every place may achieve their fullest potential and experience their best existence. Now, maintaining that North Star in our work um, is vital. Uh, it aligns stakeholders. Um, it also inspires um, stakeholders. But there's a lot of work ahead. Um, in many ways, um, we see our work um, as having just begun. There's been an extraordinary foundation built. There have been many that have come before us. But there's much work that lies ahead in building capacity, in taking really hard conversations and really difficult, um, difficult actions and, and moving them into a way where we learn how to make an impact and we actually transform and we overcome all the forces that will keep us in the status quo. That is really hard business. The tools and the experience and the partnerships and the network though that has built is primed to allow us to now engage really in moving that forward. Um, so now we build more capacity, we build greater capabilities, we do the hard work with our sleeves rolled up, learn how to make an impact and then scale. As we come to the end here, I'd like to transition a little bit. We know that well-being matters on these big macro levels of, of big systems of society and big organizations and communities. It matters also on the really individual level and, and for each and every person. So I'd love to ask each of you this question. As leaders, as very busy clinicians, leaders in your healthcare organizations, in the national research landscape, in your communities, as you reflect on this last year or so, 
what has tested you the most and, and what has sustained you as you've been tested? Um, Brita, I'm wondering if I could come to you first and then to Carly. Sure. Um, it has been a year like none other. Um, and I think what has perhaps tested me the most is maintaining the vision uh, in spite of resource constraints uh, beyond which, you know, again, we, we've never seen before. Um, in addition to kind of compounding resource constraints, misalignment of incentives as well. Um, and when other leaders may not have the same vision that I do. But perhaps what has sustained me is also that vision um, and just continuing to do the right thing and get others on board along the way. Um, what may have tested me the most is the continuous um, worry, uh, anxiety um, that, um, that we may not be doing right now the thing that needs to be done most. Um, and so very, um, urgently wanting to move towards uh, real impact and improvement uh, manifest in people's lives and knowing that we do have uh, constrained um, resources. Uh, and so ensuring that we're making the most of those resources, including our own time, energy, passion um, in ways that, that actually manifest as efficiently and effectively as possible in real change. Uh, and there's a lot of unknowns. Um, and so uh, it's a question that uh, I know I ask myself multiple times a day, uh, as do our teams. And what sustained me in all of this um, has absolutely been the extraordinary people that I am inspired by, surrounded with, bolstered by, um, challenged by um, also every day, um, in including um, uh, working with um, Dr. Roy uh, and, and, and many others, both locally and nationally. Thank you. Thanks to both of you extraordinary people who have certainly helped sustain so many in this work, including me. I have one final question and I, I will invite Carly to answer it first and then Brita to add on or echo and, and have the last word to, to this question, which is how might public health, healthcare and community-based organizations and professionals evolve to fundamentally transform the way that we think and act about health, well-being, and equity. We can, with great humility and servant leadership, come together and uh, collaborate uh, in ways that redistribute power. That's a hard thing to do, um, but that the way, the way in which we work together, the way in which we strive towards uh, outcomes that matter, um, I do believe that's a place that we can start. Uh, and that means not only um, leadership coming together, but it also means leadership handing power to those that don't, have not traditionally had the power and doing so authentically, legitimately resourced um, in all kinds of ways. Uh, and so it's a really a, a fundamental transformation of who we are and how we are. Um, and then in, in and through that, um, we can lead to um, changes really in sustained um, health, well-being, and equity. And I will echo all of that and not sure that I um, can say it any better or really have much to add, um, except just to summarize this entire conversation by by reminding us that this work is inherently cross-sector. Mm -hmm. And so um, to exactly Carly's point, we just need to rethink how we can share and lead together, lead equitably um, with healthcare and other partners at the table to truly improve the communities that we live in uh, so that the communities themselves can support their own health and well-being in an equitable way. Thank you both so much. 
Thank you, Carly. Thank you, Brita, for sharing your insights, your lessons learned, where you think we might still need to go. I am so deeply grateful for the critical work that you do every day in your communities. I'm grateful for the privilege to have had the opportunity to do some of this in partnership together um, as we work to improve health, well being, and equity of communities across the country and the world. Thank you very much.